Thank you very much for this invitation to talk here in Singapore. Today I'm going to talk about the utility of typing carbapenemases. I'm sure all of you in the audience are very familiar with the concepts of AMR and also its clinical significance. It's projected over the next 30 years that the number of deaths due to infections with AMR organisms will be 10 million globally, which will actually exceed the number of deaths due to cancer. Of course, for many of us, the most problematic issue with AMR is actually carbapenemase producing organisms. Here in Asia, it's predicted that we will actually have the world's greatest number of deaths due to carbapenem resistant organisms and antimicrobial resistance. And so for this reason, it's clear that this issue of carbapenemase production and detection of carbapenemases is crucially important. Several years ago, uh, Patrick Hallett Harris and myself, along with a number of colleagues from Singapore, uh, put together a randomized trial comparing piperacillin tazobactam with meropenem on mortality for patients with E. coli or Klebsiella bloodstream infection. And we really had to apologize that our results were really quite different from what we expected. In our Merino trial, we found that those patients who were randomized to piperacil and tazobactam had a higher mortality than those patients randomized to meropenem. And for this reason, carbapenems such as meropenem have become a standard of care, certainly for ESBL producing organisms and often empirically in many, many clinical situations. Of course, a consequence of increased carbapenem use is increased carbapenem resistance. And if a person is critically ill, it's like going along this road in Bolivia called the road of death. If you're critically ill and you encounter an infection with a carbapenem resistant organism, the chance of you falling over the edge and succumbing to your infection are unfortunately incredibly high. Now, many of you will be very familiar with using colistin for carbapenem resistant organisms. Unfortunately, of course, carbapenem resistance treated with colistin is frequently associated with nephrotoxicity. And therefore, we've been searching for alternatives to colistin as treatment of carbapenem resistant organisms. In this uh, observational study performed in the US, patients with CRE were evaluated as to whether they received colistin or keftazidim avibactam. This is not perhaps the most conventional way of illustrating the results, but you can see that uh, in panel B, the black shading is the patients who died, and similarly in pa panel A, the black patients are those who died. And when you look at the lighter gray, those who are discharged home in the two panels, you can see that panel A, which was those patients who received keftazidim avibactam, were less likely to die and more likely to be discharged home than those patients who uh, received colistin. So I think the world is turning now, turning away from colistin to other alternatives like keftazidim avibactam. But does this antibiotic combination affect every different carbapenemase? And the answer is clearly no. While it is active against KPC producers and OXA48 producers, it is not active against metallobetalactamases, MBLs, such as NDM, IMP, or VIMP. 
This to me is one particular reason why we should be trying to type carbapenemases so that we can work out which organisms is their utility in using keftazidine, maybe Bactam, and in which do we need to go back to colistin? Now, if it was the United States, it's pretty easy. And that is because the vast majority of areas of the US, KPC absolutely dominates. And therefore, it would be a good bet that you had, if you had a carbapenem resistant organism, that you could safely use keftazidim avibactam. But if, for example, we were to evaluate Singapore, and uh, many of you are familiar with the CAPE study, you will see that the types of carbapenemases are actually quite diverse. And in fact, in some periods of time, KPC in the yellow dominates, whereas in others, NDM dominates. So if we were to be using keftazidim avibactam throughout these periods, we in fact would be very compromised if it was a period of time in which we had a lot of NDM. Similarly, you can see that even when KPC dominated, NDM was still quite a substantial cause of carbapenem resistance. In Australia, the situation is different. In Australia, we have a lot of imp. Uh, you can see in Enterobacter how it dominates. In E. coli, we have a lot of NDM and uh, a little bit of imp, some OXA48. And in Klebsiella, you can see it's really quite a mix. And so this is again an emphasis about this situation that we need to be clear about what carbapenemases are present so we can decide which antibiotic a patient should receive. Now, avibactam is not the only new beta-lactamase inhibitor. There's vaborbactam, relibactam, and even some new broad-spectrum beta-lactamase inhibitors. Now, what about all of these others? Well, OXA48, unfortunately, meropenem vaborbactam is not active against OXA48 producing organisms. With IMP, some of the newer, broader spectrum beta lactamases may be compromised. And PER may compromise sofiterocol. Now, what is sofiterocol, you ask? It is a new sidero 4 cephalosporin, which can sneak in through uh, iron uh, transport channels through the outer membrane. It can evade most beta-lactamases, but as I've just mentioned, not necessarily all of them. So even this new Trojan horse antibiotic may be compromised by the presence of certain carbapenemases. So we really do have some need to detect carbapenemases, and in my mind, to type carbapenemases. Now, we could do this by phenotypic or genotypic means. But first of all, we need to know, do we need to do this on all of our carbapenem resistant organisms or how should we triage this? So first, we need to know whether an organism is likely to be producing a carbapenemase or not. We can define a suspected carbapenemase producer if there is reduced susceptibility to carbapenems, either by disc diffusion or MIC. CLSI, for example, would define isolates with an MIC of less than or equal to 1 for meropenem or imipenem, or an MIC of less than or equal to 0.5 for ertapenem as potentially having a compromise to carbapenems. Now, if you're using semi-automated methods like Vitec, there'll also be uh, a, an instruction in certain situations that this is a carbapenem-resistant organism 
that may be a carbapenemase producer. Well, how are we going to do it if we're using phenotypic methods? Well, you'll see here that there is really a, a large variety of phenotypic typic methods that are potentially available. So for example, we've got growth-based assays, which measure resistance based on growth in the presence of an antibiotic. And an example is the modified Hodge test, and also the modified carbapenem inactivation methods that you'll, you can see illustrated there. We also have, as you can see in B, C, D and E, hydrolysis methods. These detect the product of hydrolysis that's catalyzed by carbapenemase enzymes. So for example, the CARBA-NP test, uh, there's also variations that could be applied using MOLDI-TOF. And finally, in J, you can see lateral flow immunoassays that, again, are uh, really, in this situation, through the use of specific antibodies, able to tell us potentially here, not just do we have a carbapenemase, but which type do we have? Just in brief, the modified Hodge test that you can see there in A, it involves streaking a clinical isolate in a line away from an ertapenem or meropenem disc, which was placed previously on an agar plate inoculated with a lawn of a carbapenem susceptible E. coli. So this test will rely on the ability of carbapenemase producers to decrease the local concentration of carbapenems, enabling the carbapenem susceptible E. coli to grow uninhibited around the streak line near the carbapenem disc. And that's what produces the clover leaf appearance. Now, the carbapenem NP test is widely used. And so this measures the in vitro hydrolysis of imipenem in bacterial extracts, extracts and produces color changes within about two hours. Now, we, there are some targeted carbapenemase assays. So some of them have a synergism with, for example, boronic acid to detect KPC. There's some that uh, we use synergism with boronic acid and cloxacillin to detect AMPC, and some in which we use synergism with EDTA for the detection of metalloenzymes. So overall, the choice of which of these phenotypic methods to, to use is going to be dependent, for example, on your regional molecular epi, what are the actual performance characteristics of these tests, uh, their labor needs and uh, cost and turnaround time. So no single one of these phenotypic assays is perfect and it's up to an individual lab to think about what is the most suitable for their needs. Now, as I mentioned, a number of genotypic methods are available and there's some that are available commercially. So, for example, GeneXpert has a CARBA-R test, which will detect and differentiate KPC, NDM, VIM, OXA48, and IMP1. And this can even be used directly on fecal samples, so for infection control reasons. And the results are typically back within an hour. From blood culture bottles that are positive, there is now the BioFire Blood Culture Identification 2 panel. And you can see that it can detect a number of antimicrobial resistance genes, including IMP, KPC, OXA48, NDM, and VIM. So for example, here we could determine that a positive blood culture bottle has Klebsiella pneumoniae and that it produces an NDM. So this has potential clinical utility in how we would manage a patient with bacteremia with a, a carbapenem-resistant Klebsiella.
I know Perry, Patrick Harris and I have just had a, an article accepted in CMI in which we've looked at culture independent detection systems for bloodstream infection. So in this scenario, we're even trying to go earlier and to determine whether we can have a detection of bacteremia, even without having to do cultures. So there are a number of assays, and you can see that uh, there are at least four of them under development in which we can detect the presence of organisms within six or eight hours from the blood being collected. And with some of these assays, such as T2, we could also determine whether there are certain resistance genes present. So I think this will certainly be a way of the future in which we are uh, doing culture independent means for uh, detection of organisms and carbapenemase genes. It's also potentially possible to use long read sequencing to directly from a clinical sample determine if there are carbapenemase genes present. Long read sequencing has advantages, for example, in looking uh, in detail at plasmid structure. Genome sequencing, whether it's long read or short sequence, short read, can allow us to determine whether or not there are certain uh, relatedness of isolates from different patients in, for example, the same ward. So unfortunately, in most Asian countries, there will be a variety of carbapenemases. We don't have the simple US situation of everything being KPC. So for example, in China, or patients who have recently been to China or the US, they may have KPC producers, but we may have NDM producers, OXA48, or a variety of metalloenzymes. I really feel that the world is changing and that colistin will soon be replaced by new beta-lactams or new beta-lactamase inhibitors. Unfortunately, none of these new drugs, while they will uh, not carry nephrotoxicity, they will not be able to cover all of the carbapenemases. And therefore, we need to type for carbapenemase activity and more importantly, what type of carbapenemase is present. Phenotypic methods can give us some clue, but it's really going to be genotypic methods which are going to be able to help us in most detail. As I've shown you, there are some commercial genotypic methods available. There are some which are being developed which do not require culture. In the main, whole genome sequencing particularly with long read sequencing, could be regarded as the gold standard and undoubtedly will get quicker and less expensive as time moves ahead. Thank you so much for your attention. Do you expect um, meropenem use to increase following the publication of your results in the Merino trial? Yeah, so uh, this is a great question. And of course, we actually hypothesized that piperacil and tazobactam would be just as good. And so in a way, we were really quite disappointed because we don't want to be pushing uh, carbapenem use. But the results, as far as we saw them for E. coli and Klebsiella were pretty unequivocal that uh, use of a carbapenem was associated with lower mortality. And in fact, a lot of the patients enrolled you know, came from Singapore. So I think it's very applicable to the Singaporean situation and the situation more broadly in Asia. Uh, with Merino 2, where we looked at Enterobacter, uh, Morganella, etc., it, it was a much smaller study. It wasn't as conclusive, although in my mind, there was a definite trend towards better outcomes with Meropenem with Enterobacter. I, I think Morganella, you know, would probably be 
Kalki could probably use piperacil and tazobactam. But unfortunately, I do think that the, you know, the weight of evidence is in favour of carbapenems. And, you know, sometimes we'll be using them empirically. So their use is going to rise. And I think that underscores now the need to have um, newer agents available. And that's certainly, um, you know, something that's on the horizon for us. So following on that same thread, I have a question from the audience. Um, this, um, the question reads, um, should we recommend the addition of aminoglycosides to tazosin for um, ESBL um, infections to reduce the pressure on meropenem use? Yeah, I don't think there's any uh, trial data on that. And I think that's the concern that um, I'm not sure that we are going to improve outcomes by adding an aminoglycoside. And all we may be doing is adding toxicity. So in my mind, certainly for serious infections, uh, carbapenems remain the, the treatment of choice over piperacil and tazobactam. We've got some um, data, I guess, from meta-analyses, et cetera, that for less serious infections, it may be okay to use a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination. Whether that be some of the newer ones, keftazidine, maybe Bactam, keftolazane, tazobactam. Um, I think that there's more data there than with piperacil and tazobactam. But yeah, I, I don't think that the easy solution is just to add an aminoglycoside. So I, I wouldn't favor that as the option. Right, so um, what, what we're hearing is um, probably looking at um, the, uh, the, the, the development of more beta-lactam and beta-lactam inhibitors, and perhaps even um, improvement in infection control measures for the uh, control of such infections. So Absolutely, and, yeah. And the other thing, of course, is the duration of therapy, because, um, you know, instead of a reflex, we've got to use two weeks of antibiotics, for, for example, for gram-negative bacteremia or ventilator-associated pneumonia. You know, we can probably get by with half of that, you know, just a week. And, you know, again, trying to sort of turn off that huge selection pressure that long courses of very um, broad-spectrum antibiotics is going to, to bring us. I have two more questions coming in. Um, there are instances where we have seen patients um, with cultures uh, for Klebsiella pneumonia that have returned resistant to meropenem, but sensitive or intermediate to piperacillin tazobactam. In this circumstance, what then would you recommend? Yeah, that, that's a, it, it's clear that um, different enzymes have different, um, I guess, affinities for for different beta-lactam antibiotics. And so sometimes we do see these quite confusing results. If we were to look really closely at the MICs, often in that situation, the MIC of piperacil and tazobactam is quite close to the breakpoint. And that's an area that we got into trouble in the Merino trial when those MICs are, you know, 16 or, or so, um, and so I wouldn't, I have to say, I wouldn't trust the result of piperacil and tazobactam, but it is going to depend on the, you know, severity of the infection, what else is available that's susceptible. And, you know, I, I have to say, I'm pretty, getting pretty allergic to colistin and polymyxin B uh, because of their, you know, toxicities. Yeah. And, you know, maybe we can, for example, you know, push doses. Um, we can, you know, give prolonged infusions to try and sort of avoid often the, the need to go to, you know, more toxic antibiotics. I think most of us would be allergic to colistin and polymyxin as well <laughs> due to the side effect profile. Now we have to exactly. also move on to the focus on um, typing of the carbapenemase. And there's a question on this. The expert carbapenem um, cartridge that detects the various carbapenemase, is it compatible with the widely used gene expert machines or any particular brand of machines? Um, do you have any insights on this? Oh, I, I think they would be compatible with 
with Gene Expert. That's right. Yeah. So you know, it's a pretty easy plug in and 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 go for it. So that that's I found find that's quite widely used, um, and does seem to be generally quite reliable. Now it won't won't detect every different, you know, one of the rare you know the rarer um, metallo enzymes, for example, but we'll certainly get your KPC, NDM, VIM, OXA48, IMP1. Um, so I, I do think it's quite a reasonable test. You know, COVID has expanded our vocabulary. Um, there is variants of interest and variants of concern. So in the AMR world, um, do you foresee variants of concern or variants of interest emerging? And, and what have you um, observed um, based on the research that you've done? Yeah, I, I guess what is really interesting to me is the combination of resistance and hypervirulence. And of course, with Klebsiella, you know, that is, um, to me, a variant of, of, of concern that if, if we get our patients with liver abscesses or other disseminated Klebsiella infections, where they're hypervirulent, and we've got um, carbapenem resistance, you know, that's going to be, in my mind, quite a difficult challenge for us. And you know it is something we see quite commonly the, in terms of the very susceptible strains. Starting to see now that ESBL produces in that context, but yeah, that combination of resistance and virulence is something that really gets me worried. There are existing panel of um, tests um, in the genotypic assays for um, drug resistant infections. Um, there are only about five in that panel. Um, are there more emerging resistance mechanisms um, that um, are emerging um, and are there any particular resistance mechanisms of concern um, that have emerged that may render even the newer beta-lactam and beta-lactam inhibitors um, ineffective? Yeah, so, so one thing that uh, does worry me is uh, changes in penicillin binding proteins. You know, we've really focused on beta-lactamases, we've focused on loss of outer membrane uh, proteins or efflux. But for example, uh, sofiterocol, even as trianam, which you know, people are combining with avibactam, um, those antibiotics, uh, there are now quite well-defined uh, changes in penicillin binding proteins. So it's almost like an MRSA of the gram negative world. And we don't have ready, you know, easy detection methods. It's, oh, that's weird, an E. coli that's resistant to sofiterocol. And, and I think that might be a new frontier for us, um, that we're going to have an additional um, area of concern, and that's the, the PVPs. So the bacteria are just so clever. They're always a step ahead of us. And uh, it's, you know, I think that's in a way what makes microbiology and infectious diseases so much fun. <laughs> that's right. Um, so just along that same thread as well, um, you, you did mention quite a bit um, on culture negative diagnostic assays, um, and that's in the preprint that you have shared. Do you foresee um, these newer investigations um, replacing culture methods altogether, and how do you position this test moving into the future? Yeah, it, I mean, I, I think, you know, in terms of, you know, how do we diagnose um, the gonococcus, for example, and you know one of the immediate concerns is if we're using a, a, a non-culture based method do we miss out all sorts of information about antibiotic resistance or epidemiology but in fact our um, culture free methods particularly if we've got um, you know sequence based methods we can in fact determine resistance we can determine um, you know, what ST or what other relatedness there are to, to other strains. And so I, I do think down the line, things are going to become more automated and uh, less dependent on our old fashioned culture methods. There's a really interesting paper that actually suggests that for low income countries, instead of 
you know, the expertise required for culture and identification and susceptibility testing, that in fact, you know, our, our neighbours who have lower income and, and less trained expertise should actually go towards these culture independent molecular methods uh, rather than, um, you know, what we always would think is a, a low tech labour intensive solution, which is culture and, and susceptibility. But maybe we, we need to have a rethink both in, both in you know, countries like Singapore or Australia, but also in, in um, less economically advantaged countries. Thank you, Professor Patterson. That was very insightful and you gave us um, some uh, gold nuggets to chew upon and, and perhaps um, challenge us um, for, for paradigm shift in the world of AMR. Um, so stay safe. Thank you for joining us at this conference um, and hope to see you real soon. Thank you, Professor Patterson. Thank you. Bye-bye.